And we can start our oncology school. So I will introduce you in Russian and after that you can continue your talk. Is sure. it okay for you? Sure. And then we had discussed doing a talk on lymphoma rather than cases is what we had said. Is that true? No. Uh, or do you have some cases? Was, okay. uh, it was uh, the uh, old name of the um, our, our today's school. So uh, the title is Lymphoma, as you told. Yes. Yeah, okay. Разрешите открыть сегодняшнее мероприятие. Сегодняшняя школа онкологов посвящена такой актуальной проблеме, как лимфома. Ежегодно, ну вообще на сегодняшний день в мире существует около миллиона случаев лимфомы, и ежедневно диагностируется около тысячи случаев лимфомы. Поэтому данная проблема актуальна. 15 сентября в мире объявлено как день uh, повышения осведомленности по лимфоме, так как многие симптомы лимфомы остаются, uh, остаются незамеченными, и большая часть пациентов обращается к врачам в поздней стадии. Поэтому сегодняшняя тема лекции посвящена лимфоме, и ее читает Мартин, Майкл Джи Мартин. So, uh, dear professor, you can start your presentation now. Thank you so much for having me. And I guess it's on World Lymphoma Day, correct? Yes. All right. I think you're seeing my screen now. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so the, I, lymphoma is such an incredibly broad subject. And I mean, you could talk, anyone could talk for 10 lectures on lymphoma easily. Um, what I decided to do though, was just talk about my favorite lymphoma if someone can have a favorite lymphoma, that sounds kind of strange, but I really like Hodgkin's disease. Um, and I actually, I take care of the vast majority of Hodgkin's disease in my city. Um, in fact, I think I'm the only one who sees adult Hodgkin's disease on a regular basis in my city. Uh, I get all of the referrals. So it's quote unquote, I guess my favorite lymphoma. It's fun to treat. Um, because the vast majority of people do extremely well. It is actually also one of the only diseases where you actually really need PET scans to minimize long-term side effects and maximize long-term outcomes. Most other cancers, things like breast cancer and other things like that, you don't really need, um, you don't really need PET scans. More than anything, you need PET scans for Hodgkin's disease, but I think PET scans are way overused in other diseases. Nevertheless, let's talk about Hodgkin's. So one thing also, I guess being with the spirit of trans, uh, being transparent, I have received consulting fees from the folks that make brentoximab vedotin. So when I talk about brentoximab or et cetera, just keep in mind that they have paid me before. I don't necessarily love the drug, but there is some inherent bias there. Um, so let's start off with talking about how to stage Hodgkin's disease. There was the, these pair of papers that were headed by Bruce Chesson um, in 2014 that were published in tandem in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And they really changed the way or standardized the way that we think about treating Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but specifically how we stage Hodgkin's disease. Um, one of the things that was addressed in those papers was the role of a bone marrow biopsy. And this is going back to a older study where people were staged out with CT scans and gallium scans. And you can see that the chances of someone with A-based disease, so stage 1A or 2A disease, of actually having a positive bone marrow biopsy um, when they have a uh, been staged by CT scans and gallium scans um, is extremely low. The bone marrow biopsies add very, very little to stage 1A or 2A patients. Um, as you can see here, really B symptoms is what drives the presence of bone marrow involvement. When you then change the way that you are staging people from CT scans and gallium scans and you stage them with PET CT scans, the benefit of bone marrow biopsy essentially goes away completely. You 
I would strongly argue that you no longer need to do bone marrow biopsies for staging of Hodgkin's disease. People should be staged up front with a PET CT scan. Um, this is now looking at when you stage someone with a PET scan, looking at the chances of people having a positive bone marrow biopsy um, when they've been staged by a PET. You can see the most important column is right here that when someone is staged with PET as stage one or two, either A or B, the chances of them having bone marrow involvement um, by Hodgkin's disease is literally zero. No one had it, okay? Um, versus people who are stage three or four, they could have it, uh, bone marrow involvement at low levels, but also keep in mind that um, you're not changing management at that point in time because the management bracket for Hodgkin's disease is really broken up into favorable and unfavorable one and two, and then all threes and fours. So since bone marrow biopsy makes you three, I mean, makes you stage four, if you're already stage three or four based on your PET scan, you do not need to do the bone marrow. So I would really argue there's almost no benefit whatsoever to doing one anymore. Um, now talking about how to follow some up after scanning, I mean, after uh, diagnosis. So again, I would argue to do a PET CT scan at the beginning. We'll talk about when to do your next PET CT scan later on, and then a PET CT scan at the end. But after you've put somebody into remission, then the question comes, how do you follow them? This also comes out of that, somewhat out of that 2014 paper by Bruce Chesson, looking at people who were followed either clinically or they were followed by scans. At the time, national guidelines in the US had said that you need to scan people every three to six months for around the first five years. Now, when you actually go back and look at that, um, was it beneficial to put people through all of those surveillance scans? Um, and the answer is no, um, not at all. The two most important points I would argue are it costs nearly 600,000 US dollars to catch a relapse because you had so many negative scans. And also, regardless if you catch the disease based on scan or on symptoms, there's no difference in outcome. So there really is no benefit for routine scans. That's also true with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which was shown around the same time, where 90 9.1% of the relapses were detected based on symptoms. So it was, it were not planned scans. Uh, it, there were interval relapses. So the thing to really take away from these opening points is when you're talking about treating Hodgkin's disease and going in uh, staging it appropriately, you can save an enormous amount of money up front by doing your judicious PET scans, not doing bone marrow biopsies, and then not doing surveillance scans. If you remove all of those costs of money, um, because none of those actually changed survival or outcomes, then you could put your money into other things, such as the fancy fun drugs that I'm going to start showing you soon but really making the point of treating the patient as a whole financially, especially in any type of resource limited situation um, where you only have so much money you can spend, don't spend it on bone marrows, don't spend it on surveillance scans. All right, so now let's get to how you treat Hodgkin's disease. So this is going all the way back to 1992. So this is looking at where ABVD came from, which ABVD has been the come the standard in the United States and largely still is. We do not use MOP. We very rarely use escalated BAYACOP or BAYACOP. Um, we're very much an ABD, ABVD country. This is the study showing that it was, this is ABVD showing that it did just as good as MOP or a combined regimen. And it was uh, found to be superior back in 1992. So, uh, superior as far as it's superior to MOP, because this is the two combination. This is ABVD and ABVD MOP, but also superior in, far, in terms of long-term side effects and outcome. The alkylator burden in MOP is significantly higher, leading to a lot more 
many more long-term side effects and toxicities. So we use ABVD. A couple points to point out about ABVD, another place where you can save money, is that you do not need to give growth factors with ABVD. You can actually treat people regardless of their A and C. Um, the risk of febrile neutropenia, even with a low a and C or absolute neutrophil count in ABVD is extremely low um, to the point where giving growth factors doesn't make any sense. And actually we will treat people regardless of their white count as well. We will still check the white count before each dose of ABVD because we'll use prophylactic fluoroquinolone antibiotics, but um, don't hold for low white counts and don't give GCSF especially because GCSF and other growth factors have a potential for an interaction with the bleomycin increase in lung toxicity. And bleomycin lung toxicity, if you've ever seen it, which I'm sure you have, is an absolutely horrific thing. So doing anything you can to ev evade that or decrease that. So now I've shown another way to save money, and this is looking at the survival curves, showing there is no benefit for doing it. Okay. Um, going on to now ABD versus Bayacop, okay? It just, I think the way that this, hold on, yeah. The way the sl the, these slides are put together is we're gonna go through high-risk disease before low-risk disease, okay? So um, this, first of all, does anyone have any questions just about staging or the initial management with ABVD? I think you can continue. Okay, so we're gonna talk about high-risk disease first because that's where there's been the most changes. All right, so this is a paper looking at, from 2011, looking at ABVD versus Bayacop. Now, this is when we talk about high-risk disease patients for Hodgkin's disease, we're either talking about people who are stage 2B or three or four. Okay, and again, these people are typically staged by PET scans without bone marrow biopsies. Some of the future studies that I'll show you will uh, actually exclude um, the uh, 2B patients, but this looked at ABVD versus Bayacop in high-risk patients. And what they showed was that Bayacop patients did better um, as far as freedom from first progression, as you can see at the top line, going out to seven years, um, ABVD is about 12 percentage points inferior to Bayacop, and Bayacop is also superior for event-free survival. So then you would ask, why in the world is Bayacop not standard um, for high-risk disease since it's superior? Um, and when you're looking at there's no freedom from the freedom from second progression is also better with Bayacop. But when you look at overall survival, there is no difference between ABVD and Bayacop. Um, that is largely driven by the incredibly effective salvage regimens that we have, um, which include an autologous stem cell transplant. So when thinking about stage three or stage four disease in the US, um, where we have access to autologous stem cell transplant, there is no reason to use Bayacop up front. It has a lot more long-term toxicity, particularly it, can, it sterilizes, whereas ABVD does not. Um, and it also has a higher risk for pulmonary disease and secondary leukemias. Um, and we can salvage almost all those people with an autologous stem cell transplant. So in the US, we use a, historically we've used ABVD um, over Bayacop because we know we can salvage somebody. In Uzbekistan or in other places where you may not have ready access to ABVD, I mean, sorry, ready access to an autologous stem cell transplant, it makes more sense to potentially use something like Bayacop up front with a notion of, well, I'm not going to be able to salvage this person with a transplant, so I need to take my best shot. But again, when you, if you do that, um, if you do that, you have to be aware of the increased long-term toxicity because remember what the caveat of the study was high dose salvage therapy was planned. So you knew that all these people who relapsed, you were going to try to salvage with an auto and indeed you were able to salvage them. But again, it has to be within the context of having an auto transplant available. Um, this is looking at the cumulative index, uh, 
incidence of secondary leukemias. Um, the yellow line is ABVD. Um, the blue line is Bayacop. So as you get out to four and five years, Bayacop is causing in the uh, escalated Bayacop is causing in the blue line. It's called um, somewhere around four to five percent incidence of secondary leukemia. And as you know, um, that is a horrible uh, event when it happens, especially in the absence of an allogen and X stem cell transplant. And again, it's going to be extremely unlikely that you have an auto, an allo transplant if you don't have an all, extremely unlikely that you're going to have access to an allo transplant if you don't have access to an auto transplant. Um, that is a, usually a fatal long-term event. So that's what I was referencing, but that's just so you can actually see the numbers on it. Um, okay. Yeah. So I guess I should have had my outline up front, but Anyway, so we are st still working through the stage three, stage four disease. So where's the next step forward with these people, right? So again, stage three, stage four, um, in a situation where you have access to an auto, ABVD is the right answer. If you're in a situation where you do not have access to an auto, that's when you could consider using Bayacop instead. So what advances have happened in the US anyway? with uh, Hodgkin's disease from there. So the next step forward really has been rituximab vidotin. This is a uh, conjugated monoclonal antibody to CD30. And this is just a cartoon showing how it acts. It binds to CD30 on the uh, outside of the Hodgkin's disease uh, cell membrane. As you know, Hodgkin's disease, uh, classical Hodgkin's disease, which is again, obviously what we're discussing um, is, it, uniformly positive for CD15 or for CD30. When these antibodies bind onto the outside of the cells, they become internalized, they release the vidotin, which is a vinca alkaloid that's very potent and goes in and kills the cancer cell. So it's kind of, it's sold anyway, or is marketed as dropping a smart bomb inside the cancer cell to kill the cancer cell directly, trying to minimize some of the long-term toxicity of chemotherapy by being smarter about it. When you use this drug in the phase one study, so this is looking at uh, the first results of brintoximab vidotin in a phase one study. So these are all people who've had standard chemotherapy and usually failed multiple other chemotherapies um, before they're put onto an experimental trial. You can see the activity here on the waterfall plot is quite impressive. Even in a heavily pretreated uh, group of patients, you can see that, again, here's your line of zero. So everything going down is cancer shrinking. Everything going up is cancer growing. You can see that there's been a marked response for the vast majority of people to the, to the drug as a single agent, where the, almost everyone's tumor shrunk. Specifically, they called 86% of people had some degree of tumor shrinkage. So then after the phase one study, it went on then to a phase two study to confirm its effectiveness to get approved. Again, these are all young patients, like or most of them are young patients, average age of 31, as is classic with classical Hodgkin's disease. Um, the median number of previous chemotherapy regimens was three and a half, and some people had received up to 13 previous uh, therapies before they received this drug everyone had failed auto transplant. And um, some people had never actually ever got into a remission with anything that they ever received. And then this is the waterfall plot from that group of patients. Again, keeping in mind that some, all of these people have failed auto and some of them have failed multiple lines of therapy up to 13. And again, looking at the waterfall plot, you can see that single agent brintuximab has remarkable activity in a heavily pretreated uh, patient population of people with Hodgkin's disease. The problem is, is that the responses are not necessarily durable with it as a single agent. The long-term follow-up um, going all the way out to 10 years, which is a different slide than I have here, but this is just some of the short-term stuff, only 3% of people actually were quote unquote cured by brintoximab vidotin as a single agent. 
So while you can buy these young people more life with a median survival of 22 months, 22 months of median survival does not mean that much to a 31 year old. Um, and then your progression free survival again, right around six months, almost everyone is progressing. Um, so while it's an extremely effective drug, it is not a drug that works in the long term to cure people. So then the question becomes, can you then use it with ABVD to change your cure rate, right? So we know as a single drug, single agent is highly effective we know that in the U.S. with stage three, four disease, we use ABVD with planned auto if they fail. And so if we have this new fancy drug where 86% of highly refractory people go into remission with it, is it possible to put that into the current chemotherapy background and get better outcomes? So this was the Echelon 1 study, again, looking at young people the vast majority anyway. So the median age was in the mid thirties with uh, the study and they randomized people to ABVD versus AAVD. So one a couple quick important points to make is that if you give brintuximab concurrently with bleomycin, you run the risk of fatal lung toxicity um, to the point where somewhere like three of the first eight people that they, they combine the two drugs in, together and died from it. So don't do that. It, the risk of lung toxicity is way too high. Also with switching from bleomycin to brintuximab, um, you run another risk, uh, which is febrile neutropenia. As I had said with ABVD itself, uh, with ABVD itself, you have little to no risk of febrile neutropenia. But when you put in brintuximab bidotin, you actually have to use growth factors. Initially, there was a 17% uh, incidence of febrile neutropenia, and there were several septic deaths on this trial in the beginning. So you're adding a lot more cost when you're putting brintuximab in, because now you're having to give growth factors and you're having to buy brintuximab. When you look at the outcomes, the progression-free survival is superior for a, uh, AAVD. And again, they're calling the brintuximab etcetras, which is the brand name, which is why there's the two A's. Um, AAVD is superior to ABVD in terms of uh, progression, death, uh, progression or death. And you can see that on this curve, the hazard ratio is 0.8. 77, which is a very modest difference. If you remember that the, the Bayakop hazard ratio is 0.46. So this does add to ABVD, but it doesn't bring it all the way up to the effectiveness of Bayakop in people who do not have access to potentially an alt-hell like a stem cell transplant. The, the shift or the benefit is not as big. Another thing, to point out is that they, the way that they gauged whether or not the drug worked was based on following the Duval scores, okay? But they also included Duval scores in there that don't necessarily mean um, that you have to treat. So a Duval score is the PET score that is normalized to the uh, uptake of the liver. Okay, so a Duval score of four or five is residual disease that is, um, has greater uptake than the liver. That's how you know that you have failed with your upfront therapy, right? So you can still have residual masses, you can still have residual uptake, but really it's normalized to the uptake in the liver. So anything that is more than the liver, which is a doodle of four or five, is almost certainly progressive or refractory disease. Anything equal to the liver or lower is not. So the other caveat of this study is that they also included Duval three scores as part of the failure, which gets very argumentative because, so just making a point about the end point about AAVD does not add that much to ABVD. Um, 
And in fact, not everyone who even went on to get salvage therapy who had quote unquote residual disease at the end of the study, which is shown by this big blue arrow. Um, the reason to make that point is because the investigators saw the Duval three, even though it counted as quote unquote an event. And as you got from Dylan Patel's lecture, um, stats are all driven by events, right? So they counted it as a event as far as showing a difference between ABVD and AAVD, but indeed it wasn't necessarily a clinical event. So i.e. you did not necessarily act on a Duval 3. So from my point of view, um, this uh, regimen does not add an enormous amount other than it adds a ton of expense and it adds a, uh, both because the brentuximab is extremely expensive and because you have to add in the growth factors. So in a situation where you can go to a uh, auto transplant, I guess I'm still a believer in ABVD, even though this regimen is FDA approved and available in the US, we very rarely use it because of expense and no major difference in long-term outcome. If I was in Uzbekistan, I believe I would probably be using uh, Bayakop unless I had, again had access to auto. Um, this is the slide then making that point that I had also said about the increased adverse events um, and the requirement for primary prophylaxis. Um, you had up to a third of people having febrile neutropenia and it got down to 24% even when you gave prophylaxis, which is dramatically higher than it is with ABVD. Um, so it adds that expense as well of requiring growth factors. And then this is the overall survival. What I had shown you before was the progression-free survival, which is, depending on the availability of auto transplant, potentially the correct outcome to look at with in places where you don't have access to autos. But if you do have access to an auto, you're really getting no difference in overall survival out to five years. And that's what this curve is showing with overall survival in ABVD versus A square VD showing no significant difference in overall survival at five years. But so you have increased toxicity and increased cost. And it is still approved though in the US. So in, it is placed on our national guidelines, which are the NCCM guidelines. Um, as a category 2B, uh, the category guidelines go, one, everyone agrees that this is a good idea. 2A means almost everyone agrees this is a good idea. 2B means there's a significant divide in the community about whether or not this is a good idea. And 3 means don't do it. Um, or if you do it, everyone's going to talk about you behind your back. So. Um, it's not widely accepted despite it being out there. And I don't know if you guys have been exposed to or heard very much about brentuximab, but I don't know that it's a good addition to frontline therapy. Um, and it's also probably not the single most effective drug in Hodgkin's disease either. So if we're thinking about where we're going to go with stage three, four patients, um, with Hodgkin's disease, and again, how we're going to move the bar off of ABVD, there's actually a more effective drug. Um, so I don't know that brentuximab is going to have a long-term use up front, even though it has a quote-unquote positive study. As I showed, the study had problems with the endpoints. Not everyone who quote-unquote failed therapy actually needed any more therapy. They were actually cured, um, and it's much more expensive. So this is now looking at uh, pembrolizumab or immunotherapy. This is the PDL1 inhibitor, or try the PD1 inhibitor, right? And this is looking at treating people with relapsed refractory classical Hodgkin's disease who failed prior regimens. As you know, there is a within Reed Sternberg cells one of the um, nearly universal events that happens within Reed Sternberg cells is they get an amplification of the loci on the chromosome of 9P24. Uh, on that loci, uh, the chromosome is uh, PDL1. There's also STAT3 and JAK2, but the one that's most important is PDL1. So there's almost uniform overexpression and overproduction of PDL1 within Hodgkin's disease 
<clears throat> within Hodgkin's disease cells. So based on that, pembrolizumab was uh, tried in refractory patients. These are people looking at the different cohorts who have either failed both uh, stem cell transplant and brintuximab, people who had failed uh, brintuximab but never had a transplant, um, people who had a transplant but no brintuximab. So looking at three different cohorts. Um, so again, a high, heavily uh, pretreated patient population um, with the vast majority of people having over three prior lines of therapy. And you can see the waterfall plot, again, showing the vast majority of these people who have failed brintuximab and failed transplant are responding. And one thing to know about this curve um, is that this is not everyone progressing on the progression-free survival curve. As you know, every line is a sensor event or basically somebody either progresses or it gets to that point in time in the study where uh, um, you censor the data and that not necessarily fail. So the reason the curve goes down like this is because of that's only as long as people have been followed. Not These people have not progressed. These people are actually getting a plateau somewhere around 50, 60 percent, unlike you saw with brintuximab, but like you did see with lung cancer for any of you guys who were at the lung cancer lectures, um, you're getting the same durable responses and long-term plateaus in heavily pretreated patients with Hodgkin's disease that you treat with pembrolizumab. Um, this is looking at the three different cohorts, again, showing that prior failure uh, or prior exposure to autologous stem cell transplant, brintuximab or both does not change your chance of responding to pembrolizumab. Um, the vast majority of people are going to respond regardless uh, to this drug. It is highly active and non-cross resistant. So the next step forward is, um, oh, sorry, this is now looking at nivolumab, which is the kissing cousin of pembrolizumab. They're both approved. There's no real difference between the two of them. And again, this is just showing that even in he taking another group, looking at phase two study, where people are heavily, heavily pretreated, again, post brintuximab post transplant, showing that nearly everyone responds to nivolumab, just like nearly everyone responded to pembrolizumab. I'm um, showing these are incredibly active drugs, more so probably than brintuximab, because really of this. Um, all of these lines right here are people who are, all those dots are people who are still responding. Okay, so there's the responses are much more durable with nivolumab. Okay, and this is showing it in another way. Um, when we're looking out to 24 months progression free survival, people who responded with a CR have a median duration of response of 22 months, progress, uh, partial response 15 months, stable disease 11 months. And survival probabilities are nearly 100% for the people who respond. If you remember with brintuximab, the median progression free survival was just um, under six months. So nowhere even close to what you see with the checkpoint inhibitors. Arguing that these are going to be much more promising drugs long term to use upfront because of the durability of response. Um, another thing to know about checkpoint inhibitors is you don't necessarily have to stop them when the cancer is getting bigger. So that can actually be a flare phenomenon in the beginning. And this is just showing within Hodgkin's disease, about half of the people who quote unquote progress or their cancer gets worse, um, about half of those people will actually uh, then go on to have their tumors shrink back down again. So when you're using the drugs, you really use them based on, and you decide when to, when to stop using them based on how the patient is doing. It's not just a simple, oh, the tumor grew. It is the tumor grew, their B symptoms returned, um, 
they're losing weight or something else like that, there has to be able to, there has to be clinical deterioration with the radiographic deterioration. <clears throat> and this is just showing similar things, showing that people uh, who are treated beyond progression can continue to do very, very well. All right. So the next obvious step forward would be, and this is really where we are at right now, is looking at people with stage three, four disease still and following the same model as was used with Brentuximab, but this time using uh, AVD, again, removing the bleomycin for risk of synergistic lung toxicity and adding in nivolumab. Okay, so this is again treating young patients, age 37, but with bad, bad disease. And this is showing the PET scans um, based on uh, after the treatment is concluded. So again, that will be six months of treatment with AVD plus nivolumab. You can see at least in this study, everyone responded, essentially. Everyone's tumor shrunk. Everyone got better. A small study, but it's probably the future. This is looking at progression-free survival. It's only out to nine months. Um, so it's uh, hard to say very much because it's a, still a first-line study, but that looks very good. It has to be followed for longer, okay? So I would argue stage three, four disease currently is ABVD in the US because of access to auto transplant. I would argue that um, what's coming is not brentuximab plus a, uh, ABD, really nivolumab plus ABD, I think is what's actually going to change the barometer and change uh, cancer care for Hodgkin's disease. So what do you do after someone fails? I've already shown you the salvage data on brentuximab um, and nivolumab. Um, for how to salvage somebody. Um, as far as with chemotherapy, um, all chemotherapies are essentially the same for salvage um, when you're giving chemo alone. I typically use GDP more than anything else. Um, it is a simple outpatient regimen for us with gemcitabine, dexameth dexamethasone, and cisplatinum is just as effective as DHAP, ESHAP, ICE, or anything else, but it it's, can be given as an outpatient. And this is based on this paper by Crump et al. and JCO. So arguing that uh, standard salvage would be uh, GDP, and then taking someone to an autologous stem cell transplant if possible. If you don't take them to an autologous stem cell transplant, um, the vast majority of them are certain to die, okay? Again, this is just more data showing it, and you'll have a copy of all of these slides showing um, that GDP is essentially the same as DHAP, though it's outpatient, and then just showing with this curve down here showing that quality of life was significantly better with GDP than DHAP. It's much less toxic. It's much easier to give. Um, and the survival is the same post-transplant, regardless if you got DHAP or GDP, which is what this graph is showing. But again, you have to get them to transplant if they've relapsed, okay? So um, we, uh, in a situation where I use mainly ABVD, I do not use AAVD upfront for Hodgkin's disease. My actual favorite salvage regimen is not GDP anymore though. I will only use GDP if I, for some reason, gave brentuximab up front. If you have not used brentuximab up front, an extremely effective salvage regimen is using brentuximab and bendamustine um, uh, as salvage therapy. And again, you can see the schema here for that. And looking at it, those, these people were taken uh, so overall survival was extremely good. And one thing that was also very interesting from this regimen as a salvage regimen was that 
even people who did not go to transplant did not all uniformly die. They don't actually, in the progression free survival, give you that third curve. But these are the people who went to transplant. This is everybody. So you can imagine that the curve would be down here, but not all the way down here for progression free survival after um, just using brentuximab and bendamusti. So that might be a very reasonable salvage regimen to try to use in the absence of going to transplant. Um, if you did not have access to a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, probably the most expensive but most fun thing coming up in salvage therapy is if we've got these two drugs, brentuximab and nivolumab that do so well, what if we gave them together to somebody? So this is looking at a small study of just 62 people um, who again are all very heavily pretreated, who have failed other therapies. Um, and again, the responses were dramatic. Um, this, is S, you, uh, this is changes in SUVs on the bottom, which is much more difficult to interpret with the use of immunotherapy. So I'd really focus on the top um, graph where you can see a dramatic benefit for people receiving this doublet of therapy where 99% of them responded. So questions about auto, I don't think you have wide access to auto. Um, I don't think you have wide access to auto transplants. So um, I won't go through any more pontification about autos. Um, moving, any questions about salvage therapy or stage three, four disease? Anyone? All right, I guess I'll keep going. All right, so now looking at other ways to treat. Um, so now we're gonna start talk, moving on and drifting towards low risk disease, okay? Um, so for low risk disease, uh, you can use ABVD or Stanford 5. Uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with Stanford 5. We use it in pediatrics, but we almost never use it outside of pediatrics. This is just showing that in uh, low risk patient, I mean, in high risk patients, you cannot use STAND for five, it's inferior to ABVD, but for stage 1A or 2A, you could potentially use it. This is looking at if you try to use it in people with 2B, 3 or 4 disease, it's inferior. It's just not enough chemotherapy because you're done with your STAND for five in just eight to 12 weeks, okay? And again, this is showing that people who have locally advanced disease, you cannot get away with Stanford 5. You have to use ABVD. Um, again, driven by the people who have higher risk of disease. Um, people with the IPS 3 to 7, the ABVD um, uh, uh, IPS scores of 3 to 7, uh, Stanford 5 is inferior. So though some people will bring up and talk about it, really, I don't really worry very much about it. I've actually never given Stanford five. You could try to get away with it in a young person trying to get away with just the eight to 12 weeks of chemotherapy um, who had low risk disease, but it, it's rarely used outside of pediatrics. All right, so moving on fully now to low risk disease. So. Question is for someone who's stage 1A or 2A, how much therapy or how much ABVD do they really need? And this was really defined on the Hodgkin's uh, HD10 trial. Again, so we're making a big shift now because everything I've been talking about, because really that's where all of the fun progress has been, has been in high risk disease or stage three, four disease. Um, so now let's talk about low risk disease, okay? where all we're gonna talk about is a bunch of ABVD. Um, so this, no fun drugs, no fun waterfall plots. Um, so stage 1A or 2A, this is a large randomized trial looking at almost 1400 patients. They're randomized to four different arms. These are again, stage 1A or 2A patients. They were randomized into either receiving four cycles of ABVD and 30 gray of radiation four cycles of ABVD in 20 gray of radiation, 
two cycles of ABVD and 30 grave radiation, or two cycles of ABVD and 20 grave radiation. So really the question they were asking in, by randomizing 1400 patients is how little therapy can we give and still get good outcomes? Um, one thing to know that's just kind of cute is that this was a study that was done in Germany. And um, in the study, you had to have three sites of disease or less to qualify. So these are very good risk stage 1A, 2A patients. But in the US, we count each uh, lymph node group as a lymph node site. They don't do that in Germany. So they count lymph node groups differently. They, if you have it in your, in the US, they would count it as three different lymph node groups if you had mediastinal and hyalur lymph nodes, bilateral hyalur lymph nodes. In Germany, they would count that as one group. Um, keep it, so keeping in mind that you actually have to know how they counted the lymph node groups, but the, making the point that these are very low risk patients. Okay, so looking at the comparisons, we'll just walk through this again for stage 1A or 2A patients, looking at, this is looking at groups ABVD two versus four. There's no difference in uh, failure-free survival. There's no difference in overall survival. If you look at the difference between 20 and 30 gray, again, there is no difference in uh, progression-free or overall survival. And if you look at the people who in group one versus group four, remember in group one is the people who got ABVD times four and 30 grave radiation. Group four is the people who got ABVD times two and 20 grave radiation. There is absolutely no difference in freedom from survival, uh, sorry, in failure free survival or in overall survival. Um, people did identical. So really arguing that for stage 1A or 2A Hodgkin's disease, all you need is two cycles of ABVD and radiation, and you're going to cure over 90% of people. Escalating therapy beyond that does not help. Sorry, I just had to grab some water. All right, so then the question comes up, do you need radiation with stage 1A or, or 2A disease? This was HD6. This was a CT-based, not a PET scan-based study. It did ABVD times two CT scan. If they were in a complete response, then they just did two more ABVDs and they were done. If you had a partial response, you went all the way up to six months of ABVD. Uh, patients were randomized, um, unfavorable patients were randomized uh, to radiation in two arms, two doses of ABVD. So when you look at overall survival, ABVD um, was better out at 10 years than ABVD with radiation. And this is showing the same thing, and it's not from freedom from progression, it's long-term problems from radiation. Especially in women under 35, you're increasing the risk of breast cancer, you're increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease and other issues. So one way to actually also treat these people instead of doing the ABVD times two plus radiation, especially if you have any chance of hitting the heart with radiation or breasts in a young woman, you could potentially get away just with ABVD times two as long as they go into remission, do two more ABVDs instead of giving them the, radiate, the 20 grays of radiation. That would be another very reasonable way to treat them. Um, can we do even better though? What about PET adapted therapy? So PET scans are incredibly um, powerful tools for looking at Hodgkin's disease. So this is looking at the positive predictive value of PET scan after two cycles versus CT scans after two cycles. Now HD6, the study that I just quoted um, for trying to get away with no radiation and just four cycles of ABVD, only use CT scans. And you can see people who had a good response 
did great. People who had a decent response also did okay after two cycles. That's when they were rescanning. If you look at PET scan difference, if a PET scan is negative after two cycles, you can really find a massive amount of discrimination between who's going to do well long-term or not. PET is a way more powerful test. People who do not go PET cold after two cycles have a major problem, regardless of what their initial prognosis was. People who go PET cold after two cycles do fantastic. On that backbone, and again, this is just looking at SUV max, same idea. PET scan after two cycles is a way more powerful test. So the next step in the evolution of this was the UK rapid study. This was a study that looked at um, treating people with ABVD times three, just to be difficult. I mean, I'm not really sure why they did not do ABVD times two, but anyway, they did ABVD times three, and then they did a PET scan on them and then decided what to do. One thing to know is that 75% of people went PET negative after three cycles. So in this group of people, people who were PET negative, they stopped um, ABVD after three cycles and then they randomized them to either radiation or not. Okay, um, so people who were randomized to radiation, um, looking at it over time, had fewer progressions but more deaths, leading to both of them having a progression-free survival of 90-something percent and an overall survival of 90-something percent. Again, the one caveat being that these progressions were all went to transplant then. Um, and in the absence of transplant, it makes it a little bit more dicey, and this is only three cycles of ABVD. People who were PET positive after two cycles, they went to a fourth cycle of ABVD and gave radiation, and they actually did extremely well, much, much better than predicted. So when you're thinking about the low risk patients, again, you can either do the ABVD times two and low grade, I mean, low dose radiation, or you, you could do a UK rapid approach where you do ABVD times two to three, again, depending on if you're looking at HD6 or UK rapid, um, then do a PET scan and then finish off with three to four cycles of ABVD and avoid radiation if you're going to be hitting sensitive areas. Those are two both incredibly reasonable ways to treat low risk Hodgkin's disease. Um, and again, this is looking at how radiotherapy has some modest but not statistically significant benefit. Um, okay. Uh, and we've been going for 55 minutes. I think we've talked about 1A, 2A, we've talked about three and four. Um, two quick points to finish out. This is looking at what we haven't talked about is 2B. So this is a study that's very similar to HD10, it's HD11. It's randomizing 1600 people. Same kind of idea, forearm study, ABVD times four, high versus low dose radiation versus Bayacop times four. Looking at it, the only people who failed really or who did worse were the ABVD with low dose radiation. So arguing for stage one, I'm sorry, 1B or 2B, you could do ABVD times four and 30 gray of radiation. There is no benefit from Bayacop. There, and this is just shown that in overall survival. Last slide is looking at Rathel. So does that make sense? So 1A, 2A is either ABVD times two in radiation or ABVD times two to three. PET scan, if PET negative, finish off with four cycles of ABVD. Stage 1B or 2B is ABVD times four and 30 gray of radiation. We've talked about stage four disease already, what the future is. Four is likely nivolumab and ABVD. Really what the current is and what I do right now is I use ABVD times six. I do this based on the Rathel study. Um, again, negative PET after two is an incredibly powerful positive predictor. This is looking at that. So people with negative PET CT scans do fantastic regardless of their IPS score. Um, this is, again, the hazard ratio for, positive, for progression free survival is 43 for people who have a negative pet after two cycles. I don't think you've ever seen a hazard ratio of 43 in anywhere else in medicine. Um, so really 
the way that you would treat uh, based on rathal is you do ABVD times two, you do a PET CT scan. If that PET CT scan shows remission, you know that the patient is going to do absolutely fantastic. You do not give radiation therapy and you drop your bleomycin and you finish off with six months of AVD alone. Those people do absolutely wonderful. For the people who, who with stage three, four disease um, who do not go PET negative, that becomes a much more nuanced tumor board discussion. That's only maybe a quarter or less of patients. They're going to do much worse. You can do any number of things. You can switch them to Bayacop. You can use consolidative radiation or what have you. But keeping in mind people who with three, four disease who go PET negative after two cycles are predicted to do absolutely wonderfully. And they do not need radiation or bleomycin to finish off their six months. And I will stop there. Uh, any questions at all? Hey, professor, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I hope the audience also enjoyed it too. So it was two questions from the audience. Uh, the first one was, how do you manage with thrombocytopenia during the chemotherapy? Do you stop on the chemotherapy or you continue? And the second one, what do you do if the patient has aplastic anemia uh, after the chemotherapy? It was two questions for me, uh, okay. for you. Uh, so so um, thrombocytopenia with, in Hodgkin's disease is extraordinarily uncommon. Um, I don't think I've ever had a problem with thrombocytopenia with my regimens that I use. I would hold for thrombocytopenia, whereas I would not hold for a low white count. Um, so, cause you can there, but I, again, I've ne actually never had to do that with Hodgkin's disease, but I don't use Bayacop. Um, I use ABVD and radiation. Um, despite talking about tons of other fancy drugs, it's really just ABVD. Um, so I've never had that problem using ABVD alone. As far as aplastic anemia, so basically you're saying after you beat the hell out of someone's bone marrow and they have no bone marrow left, um, they're toast. There's really, you don't have any good options. Uh, I'm assuming someone who you're gonna say has aplastic anemia after um, chemotherapy is someone who's received many, many lines of therapy and they just have no bone marrow left. That's hospice. Mm, I see. Which is will, one I'll, big, I'll, go ahead. I, I will translate your, uh, your answer. Uh, был один вопрос от аудитории, что делает uh, наш профессор, когда у пациентов развивается тромбоцитопения на фоне химиотерапии. И он отвечает, что при лечении Ходжкинской болезни и использовании uh, схемы ABVD uh, развитие тромбоцитопении очень крайне редко встречается, чаще всего наблюдается снижение uh, лимфоцитов и лейкоцитов, поэтому там больше идет uh, лечение именно лейкопени, лимфоцитопени. Окей, okay. and you continue? You can continue, professor? Yeah, okay, I didn't really have anything else. I and mean, what about me, aplastic anemia? Yeah, so the, a, no, the aplastic anemia, that's, that's chemotherapy induced, right? Mm. I mean, so that's just, you've given them too much chemotherapy. They don't have any bone marrow left. There's nothing you can do. Okay. And uh, do, do you make some uh, grafts of the blood uh, barrel, uh, how it's called, blood bar barrel? I, I mean, transplantation of the uh, yeah. marrow. That's a, yeah, that's an allogeneic stem cell transplant then, um, which I don't think you guys have access to. Um, and allos are hard to set up and they take a long time. So if someone suddenly, mm -hmm. if you burn out their bone marrow, um, you can attempt to do an aloe, but I've never seen that successfully pulled off. Mm. Uh, the, one thing I would make, the one thing I would make sure, though, if you do you have someone who's aplastic after chemotherapy with Hodgkin's disease, that you do do bone marrow biopsies on them. Because what I have seen in that situation is I've seen marrow necrosis, actually, with Hodgkin's disease, where the Hodgkin's disease literally just kills the entire bone marrow. Um, it's, and it's a fatal event. There's nothing you can do. When you actually do the bone marrow biopsy and you take out the core, it looks purple. 
it is the most distressing, like weird, dusky purple, hypoxic looking color. And it's just dead bone marrow that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I there's see. nothing. So I've... Mm. We can, nothing to do with it. Nothing to do. Am yeah. I right? Yeah, um, hospice care. Yeah. So okay. I know the hospice is not big in Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. but for us, I, palliative care and hospice is what we would immediately discuss. Usually the option will be some blood transplantation, nothing else. I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean, blood, blood uh, fusion. Bone marrow transplant, but it's going to go very poorly. Mm, I see, I see. So I, I will translate, if you don't mind. If you sure. don't mind, I will translate. Uh, второй вопрос был, что делает наш профессор, когда развивается апластическая анемия? Он сказал, что чаще всего апластическая анемия, индуцированная химиотерапией, практически не подлежит uh, лечению, даже если вы делаете трансплантацию костного мозга, там практически нормальных результатов лечения вы не получите. При биопсии костного мозга при Ходжкинской лимфоме, особенно в таких случаях, когда развивается апластическая анемия, во время биопсии наблюдается некроз костного мозга, поэтому там практически ничего сделать нельзя. Это хосписные пациенты, и единственное является это помещение пациентов в хоспис и постоянное проведение гемо- и плазмотрансфузий. И пациенты доживают свой век таким образом. So. Uh, если есть какие-то вопросы, вы можете написать в чат или мне в личку. Если нет вопросов, мы можем завершить сегодняшнюю лекцию. So I think uh, there is no questions in the chat, so we can continue this Friday, professor. Yeah, that's all I have. Uh, but but I, I really enjoyed it. It was yeah. very easy to understand. Thank Good. you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. See you again. On Friday, thank you. See you on Friday. Okay, bye bye. bye. bye.